conference that's going to be held this year, a holy generation. And ever since we've decided the theme, it's really been a topic that I've really been thinking about and analyzing in my life. And I decided for it to be the theme for me for this year, starting now, not just when the youth conference comes. I know there's going to be a lot of good messages, a lot of good worship songs. And I know and I believe that the Lord is going to work. But for us here now, for us that are going to be hosting it, and for us as Christians, I really want us throughout this year and throughout the rest of our lives to focus, to live holy for the Lord. I look around us and the world is headed more and more into darkness, more and more into sin and in corruption. And it's, I believe, in a darker place than it's ever been before. I mean, we know very little about the deep sin that this world is in. And I look in the church and you'd expect the church to shine brighter than it's ever shown before. The greater the darkness, the greater the light shines. And you look in the church and it seems like so many people have compromised their walk with Christ. So many people have compromised the laws of Christ. And instead of walking away from the world and telling the world, hey, the things you're doing isn't right, we're, we're getting more and more okay with the things that we shouldn't be okay with, with the things that we know aren't right. Do you know how high the standard for holiness is? The Bible says that the standard for holiness is Jesus. And we all know that's impossible to reach that standard. And I believe that's what makes it easier to walk in holiness. Because all we have to do is we look to Christ. We look to Christ and He is our standards. And we are when we are walking in pursuit of holiness, when we are looking to Christ and walking in His ways and trying to please Him and to do the things that He's asked us, we are fulfilling what He has said when He says, be holy as I am holy. He's not expecting us to be perfect, but He's expecting us to put in all that we are to live out like He does. And it does not seem like the people today, like even the church today is living that out. Do we still believe that sin is evil? Do we still believe that sin exists in our midst and that the devil fights? Be, be honest with yourself. Do we still believe that gossip is a sin? Do we still believe that lying is a sin? Do we still believe that smoking is a sin? Do we still believe that sex before marriage is a sin? Do we still believe that all these things that the devil has made us comfortable with? Do you know the scariest place to be in, the scariest place to reach is to come to church, you're living for Christ, you're coming to church, you're worshiping, and you become numb to the sin that you have in your life. You become numb to the sin that you have in your life. And it doesn't bother you anymore. You come to church and you worship and you praise and you go back throughout your daily life and that sin is there, but it's like you don't even think of repenting of it anymore. And that's the lie of the enemy, that it's okay, that everything's fine. And something that really has been on my heart lately, and I've been crying out to God and praying to God, is God, don't let this generation pass away. God, don't let the people that I grew up with, the youth that I grew up with, walk away from you. You know, we look and we see in every generation, we say every generation has those people who are rebels, has those people who walk away from Christ and leave the church. And my question is, why are we so okay with it? Why do we just let them walk away instead of fighting? Why do we let them walk away instead of fighting for the body of Christ to stay united? What is the sin in your life that has made you numb? That you don't even realize that we're in God's house and that the presence of God isn't even really working in your life. It's all an emotion. When are we going to wake up to reality? Hell is real. I don't remember the last time I heard a sermon or something, or something about hell, but hell is a real place. And Jesus isn't our homie. He's not someone that we just come to and we live out like he's our friend. Like, yeah, I know I messed up, but it's fine. You know, I've been with him for a while. He's going to be okay with it. And we keep going. You want to know who God is? Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 to 11 and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. This is the God that we serve. 
he is a holy God and he is a righteous God and he is a loving God too but let's not forget about the holiness of Christ about the holiness of God aren't you guys sick and tired of coming to church and living the same and it's not anyone's fault it's really not it's all our own fault it's the way we live at home and what we bring here when we come together you know when in history whenever a revival would revival would happen if we look back on the revival of 1906 with Azusa Street. You know what they were going through that church in that period? It was called the holiness movement because what they were saying is, God, I strip everything of myself. I lay, I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of everything this world has to offer and I lay it down and I look at nothing else but you. Aren't we tired of, to just see the church, the global church? Like, I don't know any church that is truly living on fire for Christ. Like, do we really understand the joy that we are missing out on? Do we understand the peace and how powerful the church could be if we would just lay it all down and say, God, I'm living for you. And the lie of the devil says you have time, enjoy your youth, have fun. And it's good to have fun. But to a certain point, what are we doing with our lives? Jesus is coming back and I believe he's coming back very soon but even as long as we are still here we have a calling to go and to preach the gospel to preach to the lost let's come before the Lord in this prayer I want us to have a heart of a repentance and if you would just come back to Jesus like actually come back and say God I'm so sick and tired I'm so sick and tired and we're so scared to let, to let go of so many things. Chris, I can't let go. I, I, it's been, I've been too deep with this person. I've been in too deep with this situation. I've, I'm too, it's like part of me now. Just surrender it all to Christ and come before him with a true and repentant heart. And he's the one who gives true freedom and true peace. And let's seek throughout the rest of this year for the first youth night and throughout the rest of this year, a heart of purity, a heart after God's own heart. And let's pursue holiness. Let's come before the Lord in repentance in this prayer.
inside So heaven is real And death is a lie I want to hear voices Of angels above Singing as one Hallelujah Holy, holy God Almighty The great
If you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and turn it to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 14. And then 17 through 19. And this is the call of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put on his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot, a pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, disaster shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. Verse 17. But you dress yourself to work, arise and say to them, everything that I command you, do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I will make you, I will make this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls, bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Alive Youth, everyone. It's been a minute. I feel so much has been going on this uh, last uh, winter break. And um, I just want to welcome all of you guys from near and far. For those of you guys that are here for the first time, for those of you guys that are here returning, may God continue to bless you. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and welcome them to Alive Youth and say, it's good to see you back home. <laughs> I have a couple announcements before I continue to dive into the message for tonight, and um, we're going to start off with uh, the uh, offering. For those of you guys that uh, are able to give in person, we have that uh, offering coming around by Chris. Thank you, Chris. And then we have uh, the opportunity to give online through Zelle. So for those of you guys that have that uh, online option, you guys can do so uh, right now, pulling out your phones, taking a picture. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, you're just testing it. That's okay. Keep testing it with a $20 bill or, no, I'm just kidding. Whatever God puts on your heart. Our next announcement is our social media platform. For those of you guys that are here for the first time, please follow us on Alive Maranatha uh, on all of these platforms. We have our Instagram where we post up our most recent events of everything that's happening, um, that's coming up. For example, for those of you guys that went caroling New Year's party, uh, Arizona, you guys knew everything that was happening because of this platform. Our Facebook gives you guys all of the details pertaining to the events um, that took place and all the photos uh, that took place there. Uh, so you guys can take, um, you know, your, uh, your favorite screenshots, uh, the, your favorite photos and save them to your archives. And then we have our YouTube. Our YouTube is our uh, place where we record our services and you guys are able to go back on uh, our history and look and see what uh, you guys missed out on or want to revisit a sermon, a message, a worship song. That's something that we started to do. Uh, we started to record the entire service. So you guys are able and uh, to utilize that platform. So Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, you guys have that option. 
Our next announcement is our youth conference. As Chris mentioned, our youth conference name is A Holy Generation, and we are honored and excited to be hosting it this year. And so you guys are all welcome. You guys are all welcome to invite your family, your friends. And so this 2024 May, we will be hosting our youth conference at Jessup University. If you guys don't know where it's at, uh, it's off of the freeway, off, off of Highway 65. It's uh, next to Sunset uh, Boulevard, if I'm not mistaken. That's the street you guys will be going on. And so this is very, very exciting. And uh, once again, we as a board, a youth board, decided to pray every Thursday, first Thursday of the month, and fast for this specific event. And so if you guys would love to join us, please do so. If you guys would like to partake in that, um, all the prayers that you guys can uh, pray to the Lord, uh, we definitely need it. For there are many, many um, activities that will be taking place. There are many, many um, meetings that we're having. And uh, we just are doing our due diligence to bring forth what God has put in our hearts for this coming up year. So please continue to pray for the youth conference. Our next announcement is, of course, welcome back. I, I already did this, but uh, welcome back for all of you guys that were on a winter break. Yeah, it's good to be back. I feel like it's been a good minute. Uh, at the beginning of December, we went on a winter break uh, from a live youth, uh, but I felt like we were me meeting every single week because, again, we had caroling. Uh, we had a New Year's gathering. We had uh, a trip all the way in Arizona. I mean, we were traveling uh, and constantly meeting up every single like week is what it felt like with the practices and you name it. So did we take a break? I don't know. <laughs> I felt like we did not, but uh, it's good to be back. Uh, I'm really excited to see you guys all here for the year 2024. And so may the Lord continue to bless our alive youth and everybody who shows up. Amen. Amen. Our next announcement and something kind of exciting is a relationship series. Woohoo. Yeah, that's right. So keep your distances, Bibles, please. <laughs> uh, but uh, something that we want to do here very soon in the near future is we want to have a, a Bible series, uh, a relationship series. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we will keep you guys posted on our Instagram and then our announcements here at Alive Youth. And so for those of you guys that are interested in getting into a relationship, interested about uh, what it means to be single and walking with the Lord, what it means about in the process of dating and so forth, uh, we will be bringing that uh, to you guys here very soon, all the biblical based. And so um, we hope that God continues to bless all of our youth members and uh, future spouses and, and whatnot, and may God continue to bless our families, amen, because that's uh, totally and truthfully important. And uh, I think uh, that might be the last announcement, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, is that it, or did I miss anything? Nope, I think that is it. Once again, welcome back to Alive Youth. I'm so excited to be here with you guys all. And then, of course, I will see you guys on Sunday. This Sunday, we do have China Sunday, so I hope to see you guys all here. Once again, 9 o'clock in the morning, we do have prayer until 9.45. And then from 10 till 12, we have our usual service. So China Sunday is... Um, right around the corner. With that being said, I'm going to jump straight into the message. And the title of today's message is Make No Excuses. Make No Excuses. This last couple of weeks, I, um, I had an exam or a quiz. I had, uh, we had service this evening. We had uh, quite a few things in the last... Um, couple weeks that we have been preparing at home um, with our family, etc. Things were happening and a lot of events were happening. And it felt like the important things that I was supposed to do, like study for a quiz, it felt like the idea just came up that all of a sudden I have to go do yard work. <laughs> oh man, I have to go do something else. <laughs> I have to go clean the car, which I have uh, put to the side for the last three months. I have to go, you know, scrub the floors. I haven't done the baseboards in three years since I moved in, and I decided to do that a few days ago. And uh, I feel like all of these uh, things start to come up, and, and uh, for the important things in life, I feel like we come up with all of these excuses to avoid the things that are inevitable, that will benefit us, and that we're supposed to do. And um, I feel like we're great at it, <laughs> unfortunately. Unfortunately, we can be great at that, um, and that is making excuses. Um, we're great at saying, man, I don't know how. 
I, uh, I'm too young. Uh, I'm not old enough. Uh, please let somebody else do it. Um, I have a doctor's appointment. I can't make that meeting. Uh, sorry, I have to go pick up somebody from Hawaii who showed up for the first time ever, but I have to be at service, you know, the prayer week. And, and we, we come up with all of these excuses, and I feel like that um, we can be great at that sometimes, and that's unfortunate. And um, a great one that I heard is, oh, man, today I have to go clean my guns. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, but doesn't it feel like when important things come up, the excuses start to come up? In the same way, and in the Christian world, and in our walk with Christ, we can find all sorts of excuses not to obey God's voice. Oh, man, that's a preacher's job. I can't be, uh, God, uh, what is it called, um, spreading the gospel? I'm not gifted enough, you know. I mean, you need somebody who has been with years of experience to go and do missions. I've already served last week. Why am I supposed to do it again, pastor? Why am I supposed to have a meeting again, pastor? Let somebody else do it. That's the kind way. I've already done it. Please let somebody else do it. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I'm too old or I'm too young. And these are just some of the excuses that we can kind of if you're already coming up with them, you, you're relating with me because I, it has happened in my life, in my walk with Christ. I've heard two great uh, quotes. It has said that excuses are tools of incompetence, and those who specialize in them seldom go far. Another quote, Ben Franklin wrote, He that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. Hmm. Excuses. And so I want to look at the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was a prophet. If you guys have read the, the book here, it talks about Jeremiah being the prophet of God. And he had every excuse ready when God called him to be a prophet. See, his excuses are often our excuses when not heeding God's voice when he calls and so tonight, countering each excuse that Jeremiah had, was, there was also a promise from God. So for every excuse that Jeremiah was trying to come up with, God has a promise to saying, I can use you still. Once again, the title is Making No Excuses. And so I want to look at the, a biblical example of Jeremiah and his character and hopefully we can learn from him what he did, how he uh, chose his excuses, uh, and, um, and everything that he did when walking with the Lord. So to kind of give you guys a little bit of a background of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah was written about Jeremiah, which is kind of funny. But it was a compilation of a history of history of what he has done at the time that he was in Israel, in Jerusalem. And um, as I mentioned earlier, God called him to be a prophet to the Israelites at that time. See, he was a priest, and his family were priests, his grandfather and so forth. But God called him specifically for something even a little bit more special, and that was to be a prophet once again, God called him to be a prophet to the Israelite people and to the nations. Reason being is because the Israelites, for 900 years or so, were walking in a covenant with the Lord. And after 900 years, they started to sway. They started to go left, they started to go right, and they started to do things that were not of the Torah. If you guys don't know this, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. So when you hear that the Jews are reading the Torah, we're reading the Bible. It's very interesting. And so Jeremiah was an individual that God used, an instrument that God was going to use and did use to warn the people, hey, the idolatries that you guys are doing, the uh, illegal things that you guys are doing right now, you guys are going into the temple praising the Lord, and then the next thing, you guys are coming out of service, and you guys are doing things that are sinful. Yes, those things, God is bringing upon you a judgment if you do not turn your ways. And so, long story short, Jeremiah gives this warning 
Unfortunately, they fall exiled to the Babylonian people where they were overtaken. Yet through all of this, God still had his promise that he will eventually bring his people back to him. And so Jeremiah was more of a warning to the people that there will be judgment if you don't turn back to the Lord. And so that is where I want to dive in tonight. And there are quite a few excuses that were shared when Jeremiah was talking with the Lord. He was saying, God, I, I am not able to. You're calling me to this crazy task? I'm not able to. I'm not adequate enough. I think the task is way too big. I think that uh, I'm not um, at the right time in my life. I think I'm too young. I, I, I just can't. But God says, I have chosen you. And so tonight, there are about five to six excuses that I want to go over. Excuses that were portrayed when Jeremiah was talking with the Lord, but also the promises that came with those excuses. And I'll elaborate here very soon. The first excuse was the task is too demanding. The task is too demanding. See, Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 5.1. See, his, he was a priest. His father was a priest and his grandfather was a priest. See, a prophet was chosen and authorized to be a spokesman for God who declared God's word to the people. See, when we think of a prophet, man, that guy will tell the future, right? But a prophet spoke a message that was for the present, for the people that were at that time. And so God gave this responsibility to Jeremiah. See, being a prophet was more demanding than serving as a priest. And I just want to look at these two things, a priest and a prophet, and, the, and kind of give you guys two perspectives of what both respons responsible parties had to do at that time and even now. See, the priest's duties were predictable. Everything was written down, and it was the law. As I mentioned earlier, they had the Torah. The priest was sharing the Torah. This is what was written. God told me to share it with you, to deliver you this message, what is written. And we are to keep the law, to be in covenant with God. The prophet on the other end, he never knew what was the next day, what was going to happen the next day. Why? Because God has called him to do things on the instant. As a prophet, you're pretty much listening from the Lord. God, I'm available. What do you need me to do? And God sometimes talks today, waits a week, talks again, or one day, just one, two, three, talking to four or five different people, talking to a group of individuals. And so God called him to be a prophet, to be available and ready for this demanding task that was before him, and that was to share Hey, everyone, you need Jesus. You need God. You need to repent. You need to turn from your ways. And so from every city that he has gone to, he was always being available to the Holy Spirit, being available, being available to the Lord. God, what do you want me to say today? To who do you want me to say these things? See, the priest worked primarily to preserve the past. See, this is what the Torah said. This is what we need to do. The prophet labor to change the present so the nation would have a future. Hey guys, God told me today, you guys need to change. If you guys want to see a great future ahead of you guys, please change. See, the prophet had smaller congregations that he had to speak to. He had rituals, he had chinas, he had uh, gatherings, he had uh, Bible studies, he had all of these little things serving, little sacrifices that he had to do. While on the other end, the prophet had to go out and about and be ready at any time to change people's lives, to change people's hearts, to meet them where they were. Versus the priest, people would kind of come to the, to the temple and, and hear what the priest had to say. So it's quite interesting that God called him to, do, uh, to this demanding task. And to tell you the truth, it's not easy being either or. 
right? Being a priest, you had to preserve what God commanded him to do for the people. He had to preserve it. He had to explain it. He had to elaborate on it. He had to share. He had to um, warn the people. And on the other end, he, a prophet had to go above and beyond. Like, I mean, you had to put all your faith in God and say, God, I'm here. I'm available. Please use me. Sometimes you, you, you say, sometimes you're like, please, do, do you have to use me today? <laughs> do you want me to go over there today? I don't, I, don't know if, I, I don't know if I want to go beyond the borders. I don't know if I want to go in that <clears throat> uh, not so uh, fortunate place, that ghetto place or something, right? But he had to be available at all times. And so he says, God, I don't know. I don't know. Why, why are you choosing me? Why are you choosing me for this major task? Jesus, too, was also uh, called to be a prophet. He traveled place to place, challenging people to change their future so that they would one day see heaven. Jesus spoke to the hearts of the people. Most did not accept his message of repentance, for they did not want to change. And so this is the excuse that we have here. God, you want me to be a prophet? This task is way too big. You can't use me. But the promise is, God may assign you to a demanding task, but he calls, but he, but his call keeps us going when we don't want to go and are ready to quit. We have the promise of God's purpose in our lives. I like what Jeremiah 1, 5 said. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. Amen. This is means something that God created you he knows who you are he has a purpose for you just like Jeremiah God knew Jeremiah God chose Jeremiah and appointed <coughs> Jeremiah he was known by his name handpicked by God and commissioned to serve see those acts give one a great sense of purpose the promise of God God's purpose allows us to let go of our own plans and receive God's plan without fear. Like Jeremiah and Jesus, we do not need to accept that our future, is, we need to accept that our future is not ours. See, I believe that God has greater plans. We are his people. And all of you guys are chosen for a task. Some of you guys are still learning what that purpose is in life. Some of you guys are going through that purpose in life. And some of you guys are just, Beyond your years, which I love, where you guys can share information, where you guys can share your wisdom upon us of how God has been using you in your walk with him. So we are God's people. He has a distinct plan and purpose for our lives. Jeremiah's excuse, this task is too demanding. But God says, I chose you. I know you. And I will be with you through everything that you guys go through. So if we could take anything from that, we are God's people. Amen. The second excuse that shows up is my talent is inadequate. My talent is inadequate. Jeremiah 1.6 says, but I protest, O Lord. Oh no, Lord God. Look, I do not know how to speak since I am only a youth. I do not know how to speak for I am only a youth. Jeremiah felt inadequate in public speaking. You know who else in the Bible felt uh, inadequate in public speaking? Moses, that's right. He had a partner, Aaron. That's awesome. And I'll elaborate a little bit more here. For me specifically, you guys probably have your own testimonies, but when I was approached and was asked, do you want to be a part of the youth ministry? In my head, I think I, I think I was like 15, 16, 17 years old around that age. And somebody asked, hey, do you want to be involved in the youth ministry, either through activities or what it may be? And at first I was like, oh, <laughs> you're talking to the wrong person. Do you know what it takes to be in the youth ministry? <laughs> do you know how uh, people are in the youth ministry? They're extroverts. They go out, they say hi, they talk, to, they, they do all of that. Y you're asking me? No, 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 no. I felt like at that time, I was more of an introvert. So for you to ask me to be involved, I was like, whoa, I'm getting out of my comfort zone. Please, please ask somebody else. I'm way too young. I'm inexperienced. Um, I mean, the people on the board are way more experienced than I. There are people in our community way more experienced than I. 
But I believe that the Lord uses people in our lives that sees certain things in our lives that says, I see great things in them. And in the same way, I see great things in all of you guys. Seriously, you guys all have talents. You guys all have certain goals. You guys all have plans, but you guys also have skills and talent. Man, isn't our remaining community so talented, Justin? We are. Hey, man, you guys are super talented, and God wants to use that talent. And so at that time, I felt, okay, God, you're calling me. I feel very honored to be a part of the youth ministry, but I feel still very extremely inadequate. I lack so many things, but here's the wonderful thing. God has a way to overcome our weaknesses and our insufficiencies, doesn't he? I have learned over the years, however, <laughs> that the person most aware of his own inadequacies is usually the person most dependent on God's all-sufficiency. I am inadequate, and I come to the Lord, and I say, God, you are all sufficient. I lack in so many areas of my life, but God, you are so amazing, and God, you have every resource available to us. Yes, we may feel inadequate when called by the Lord, but his perfect strength is made perfect in my weakness and in yours. His glory is manifested through my flaws and our flaws. God does shine through our weaknesses. So the excuse, I'm inadequate. But here's the promise that God shares. Our talent may be, may be or appear inadequate, but God always equips those he calls. Amen. He equips those he calls. We have the promise of God's provision. Jeremiah 1.9, then the Lord reached out, his hand, reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. The touch was not so much to purify as it was to inspire and empower. That it was symbolic of the gift of prophecy bestowed on Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a huge task before him. He had to be in front of not individuals not tens of people, but eventually he would be in front of thousands of people. And he said, God, I'm inadequate in my public speaking. But he says, no, 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 no. I will put my words in your mouth. Wherever you go, I will speak. I love that. Jesus experienced this touch in a visible yet profound way. If you guys remember the baptism of Jesus, what ended up happening immediately after the water baptism? The heavens opened and the spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And God spoke, this is my beloved son. I take delight in him. God took delight in Jesus. You're mine. I will use you. I will guide you. I will be with you. And if you look throughout the word of God, God was always with Jesus everywhere he went. So God blesses sometimes not the person who has the best speaking ability, but the tongue of the person who is available and willing to speak. God uses not the most gifted and talented people, but the one that is touched by the hand of God. God uses the most unlikely people to shake a church, a community, or a nation. Never underestimate the power of the touch, especially when God does the touching and the anointing. Don't you think that there could be better people to lead our country? <laughs> I don't count this last election uh, <laughs> an election. <laughs> I could imagine there are so many more talented people that could lead our country, but they don't lead. I could imagine there could be so many people that do great missions work, but they just don't want to be available. I could imagine there, there are so many other things that could happen in your lives, certain departments that could be run better, but there isn't anybody. 
But there are those people that are willing and available. And that's what God wants. If you are willing and available, God will still use you. I mean, God used the donkey, <laughs> right? God used so many random things to show his glory, to show the people, hey, I am real. And so if he's able to use even those insignificant things, God can still use us. And God can use you. Just be available. I'm inadequate. That's okay. God wants a humble heart. He says, I will be with you. I will be wherever you go. The third excuse is the time is not right. Jeremiah, the time is not right. I'm only a youth I'm only a youth. I was doing a little bit of more research, and the youth in this, uh, for, for Jeremiah, they said the scholars were saying that he was anywhere between 20 to 25 years old. So to go from a priest to a prophet and be available to God to speak to the nations is kind of wild, isn't it? It's kind of wild, isn't it? He felt inferior, inexperienced, and intimidated by the size of the task that God called him to and summoned him to. But here's the promise. God call, God's call may come at an inopportune time, but he never sends forth his servants alone. We have the promise of God's provision. Jeremiah one, seven through eight says, then the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth for you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone for I will be with you for you, with you to deliver you. This is the Lord's declaration. Here's the condition of this promise. See, before Jeremiah could experience God's presence, he had to go where God sent him. He had to speak what God told him and reject fear. Someone once said that when God calls us to a task, he does not give us a roadmap to follow and then leaves us to our resources. No, God walks with us. See, his presence gives us strength to stand in front of every assault that may come. Jesus felt the same presence. He and his father were one he could go on. He could go on because God walked with him. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't there a difference knowing that uh, you are sent to do a task and someone's going to be alongside you? For some of you guys, you guys are alone in your guys' walk with Christ, per se, in your singleness. But the Holy Spirit is there to help you. The Holy Spirit there is there to guide you. The Holy Spirit is there to help you discern between right and wrong. So technically, you're never alone. The time is not right. But the promise is, God is with you at all times, and he doesn't leave you without any resources. There are so many stories that you guys hear of like mission work and you hear of people going and saying, I am going to go in so and so country, but I don't have the resources. If you guys want to experience this is not the right time <laughs> example, go on a mission because there you're going to be like, God, I'm, I'm so 100% flexible. I'm so depending on the Holy Spirit. I'm depending on you 100%. So whatever may come, I know you will provide. The doors will be open. Hey, man, we had a flat tire. Somebody down the street just came and gave us a free tire. Hey, we don't have any food for today. Don't worry. The mission, uh, mission workers are there going to feed you throughout the whole time you're there. Please just come and talk to our people. Please come and help us. There are so many wonderful things that happen, and you're saying, I'm inadequate on a mission trip, and you'll see how God's going to be like, don't worry. I'm providing for you. Don't worry. I have changed people's lives just because you were there. Don't worry. I'll take care of the finances. Don't worry about that. You want to go? You have a willingness? You have a heart for it? Trust me. There are people in our church that will send you on a mission trip. Haven't you guys ever heard those stories? I want to go on a mission trip. I don't have $2,500 for the airplane ticket there and back and the housing. People are like, say no more. I'll take care of you. We have so many stories. 
Yeah, I'm talking to you back there. <laughs> Hi, Denicia. Yeah. Denicia, don't you feel like that's what happened? I, I don't know, but I want to go. And God opens the doors. I've experienced that in the past too. I've gone a couple mission trips and I'm like, God, I want to go, but who's going to provide the $1,300 flight? <laughs> and God made a way. It's not the right time. I'm too, I'm too young. No. If you're willing, God will be able to use you. The next excuse is the, teach, uh, the teaching is dangerous. The Lord did not give Jeremiah a joyful message of deliverance to announce, but a tragic message of judgment. Consequently, Jeremiah would be misunderstood, persecuted, arrested, and imprisoned. More than once in his life, he was threatened. People did not want to hear the truth. Jeremiah told them plainly they were defying the Lord, disobeying the law, and destined for judgment. So as a prophet for Jeremiah, God, you want me to go where and tell people what? You have the wrong person. And God says, no, I have chosen correctly. I have chosen you. I know that you will be going through some tough times, but my will is better than our will. And throughout the story of Jeremiah, God continues to use him. God continues to use him in an interesting way. Some listened, some did not listen. And the majority did not. The reason for the judgment was Israel's idolatry and rebellion against God's righteous will. Again, God called him to this task and the teaching was dangerous yes but we are his children and he knows what's best he knows what's best jesus teaching contained mercy and judgment grace and punishment jesus's teaching were dangerous to the fact that what did they do they crucified him it cost him his life but the promise is this. What God says through us may be dangerous, yes. But God gives us the strength to endure it. When we have the promise of God's prevailing. Jeremiah 1, 18, 18 through 19. Today I am the one who has made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the population. They will fight against you, but will never prevail over you since I am with you to rescue you. A fortified city, an iron pillar. See, they are solid and unshakable like the God who convinced them, who, who conceived them, sorry. And the prophet who they would come to characterize. See, God assured Jeremiah, attack they will on you. But overcome, but overcome you, they will not. The person who stands with God will prevail. Someone once said, one with God is a majority. Alone we are hopeless or helpless. With God we prevail. There's a story from the Roman Empire era. If you guys remember the great Colosseums, right? What would happen in those coliseums? They would be considered like, uh, what is that movie called? <whistles> Hunger Games. <laughs> I guess you could consider it somewhat like that. Where people would fight each other, where people would kill each other, where people would be fighting against uh, lions and animals to the death. And this was pretty horrendous, if you guys can think about that. Pretty sad. It wasn't a war. It was just for fun. It was to see an entertainment like seeing a movie today. When Heronius was an emperor of Rome in AD 404, there was a vast crowd watching the contest. A Syrian monk by the name of Telemachus leaped into the Colosseum floor. 
so torn by the utter disgrace for the value of human life, he cried out, in the name of God, this thing is not right. In the name of God, this must stop. The spectators became enraged at his, his courageous, at this courageous man. They mocked him and threw objects at him. Caught up in the excitement of that moment, the gladiators attacked him and a sword pierced him. The monk fell to the ground and he died. The entire Colosseum fell silent. For the first time, the people with the insustainable bloodthirst recognized the horror of what they had called entertainment. Telemachus kindled a flame in the hearts and consciousness of the thinking person. Because of his bravery, because of this courageous man, the story goes that uh, as the months went on and on, the combats started to dwindle because people recognized and realized, what are we doing? What are we doing? This is evil. And why did this happen? Because one man dared to speak out for what he believed was right. His message was dangerous for it challenged the pleasures and enjoyment of the people. Though Telemachus died, his message prevailed. See, just like us, there are some things and moments in our lives where we're like, I don't want to go talk to that guy. Do you see that guy? And you want me to go talk to him about the Lord? <laughs> Let me give you a story. My uncle tells me, told me the story, and I think I've already uh, shared it with you guys a while ago. My uncle Gabe lives up in Washington State. He ends up getting in line at a Nike store because his kids are planning to go to school this coming up semester at that time. And he tells his kid, please go get your shoes and come back and uh, we're going to purchase it. So he's in line and there's this gentleman in front of him and this guy is like buff. He has tattoos everywhere. Him and his wife are there and his little girl. And God tells Gabe, hey man, go pay for their stuff. <laughs> my, my Uncle Gabe, you know my Uncle Gabe, he's bald dude, buff. If you've not known, he's done uh, kickboxing, by the way. Um, so he, he, he's like, God, are you sure? God puts it on his heart. What you're going to do is you're going to pray for them and you're going to pay for their food, uh, uh, pay for their stuff. Oh, now I have to pray for them? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. They're coming to the cashier and there's this old lady paying for somebody and there's this other person, uh, their, their items are getting paid for as well. And he goes, if that lady's cashier uh, if this person at the old lady leaves first before this person who had a young cashier, then I will pray for them. You know how it is, right? You, you see an old person, oh, they're going to take forever. They're going to be there for three minutes. This young person, do, 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 give me your card, ready to go. We're going to pay for their stuff and then move on. And he goes, I put it before the Lord that if that old lady's cash, that person leaves before this person, then, uh, then I'll pray for them. <laughs> What do you know? The young person's cashier had issues with the cashier. <laughs> the system is going, something's going on with the system. You have to wait on a couple of more seconds. Gabe is like, oh man, okay. What do you know? This person leaves. This person's still having issues, technical issues with the cashier. And he goes, hey man, <laughs> God put it on my heart to pray for you. God put it on my heart to pay for your, your kids, your kids' items. Man, in the middle of a store, they start praying. In the middle of a store, they start, at this point, you're like, man, I'm listening to you, God. I don't care what people think and say. And so they ended up praying for him. He ended up praying for them. He goes, thank you, man. I really appreciate you. Guess what? Thank you for that. Something just happened with my house. With my house. And we're kind of dealing with our financial issues. Not only that, he goes, I just gave my life to the Lord not too long ago. Praise God. You just have to listen to what God has, tell, uh, has told you and do it. <laughs> he could, I could imagine he's looking at this bald dude with tattoos and say, oh, man, this is dangerous. But what do you know? God used him in that moment 
in the same way. Obviously, allow the Holy Spirit to dis, you know help you with the discernments in life. <laughs> Don't just go up to some random dude and just say, hey, Jesus loves you, I love you. You know, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And there will be moments in your life where you're like, God, this is way too dangerous. I can't do this, but God's with you. God's with you, and he's with you. So trust him through the process. The last excuse that we see here out of the book of Jeremiah is, do I have to go now? (laughs) See, God was expecting immediate action from Jeremiah. God said out of Jeremiah 117, God said, now get ready, stand up and tell them everything that I command you. At that time, Jeremiah, he wore, I can imagine, robes and belts. And so when he told him, get up, get ready to go, in our day and age, I could imagine it saying, pull up your sleeves. It's about to get real. The locations that you're going to be going to, get ready to run if you have to. (laughs) Wherever I send you, get ready. Stand up and just speak what I have commanded you. See, God called Jeremiah to act, to act. He was called to move out, move out among people. He was called to deliver an offensive message. He would not be welcomed, nor would he be accepted. He would anger his hearers. Sometimes God just wants us to do what he has called us to do. We might think the situation is dangerous. We might think that the message is dangerous. We might think that we're inadequate. We might think that we're not capable. But God says, just do what I tell you, and I will take care of the rest. Just do what I tell you. Listen to me, and I will take care of the rest. As a father, I want my boy to listen to me. (laughs) I tell him to do something, and he does the opposite thing. I'm like, oh, man, we have to go to church, and now you want to run run around? (laughs) Now you want to escape us? God has called you to obey him, and you would sometimes never see the results when God calls you to something like that. Sometimes you will, but he wants obedient children God ex- expects obedience. This is the promise. God expects obedience immediately. If we do not, we are in danger of God's wrath. We have the promise of God's power. Jeremiah 1.17, do not be intimidated by them or I will cause you to cower before them. God says, I will be with you wherever you go. Say and do as I say. If not, you will fall to embarrassment or whatever it may be. See, Jesus obeyed. Whatever you think of, whenever you think of Jesus, remember this. His heart was a willing and obedient heart. He will always, he always did what the Father directed. There was no hesitation, no questioning, no just like no circumventing, only immediate action. Are there moments in our lives where we are like, ah, God, do you want me to go do that right now? Do I really need to do that? See, God calls you to certain things in your lives, and I pray that we listen to those callings. I pray that we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit to understand, God, when you called me, help me to go, help me to move, help me to react, because he has a perfect plan. And I pray that he uses all of you guys and that we're all obedient to him. Has God, has God called you to a specific thing in your life? Can we all stand in closing here? Maybe you're wondering, God, I I just became a Christian. What is my calling? That's great. We'll be learning that together here very soon. Walking with the Lord, he'll reveal to you every single day what your call is. For some of you guys, God has already called you to something, and you're just hesitant of doing it. I liked what you said, Justin. Is there something that you guys are holding on? Is there something that you're not letting go? And you're saying, okay, God, here I am. I'm available to you. Use me, guide me. Has God called you? Then he will fulfill his purpose in you. He will equip you. 
He will enable you. He will protect you. He will accompany you. Are you obeying his commands? Then he will, then he is with you to protect you. Are you sharing the word? Then he will accomplish his purpose no matter how the people will respond. I believe that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. He has better plans than what we can imagine in our walk with him. So tonight, if I can encourage you guys, this year, 2024, try to get rid of those excuses in your life. Lean on the promises of God that he will be with you through everything that you guys do. Through the trials and tribulations, trust me, he is still there with you. Let us pray that God continues to be with us this year, that we are more courageous, that we are more obedient to him, and that we constantly walk in his perfect will in our lives with him. Let us pray.